Hello, uh, everyone. Thank you for coming to the second day of the Ensuring Software Quality Track at DevConf US. Uh, the next talk is OpenShift on uh, OpenStack by Eric and uh, Emilio, and I'll hand, them over, uh, hand it over to them. <laughs> hey, guys. My name is Eric. And my name is Emilio. Uh, this summer, we worked in Boston on the OpenShift on OpenStack team. And this is our presentation on overcoming development challenges. So, show of hands, who here is familiar with OpenShift? <laughs> cool. All right, so for those of you who aren't, OpenShift is an application platform that runs uh, Kubernetes containers. And it can be used to dynamically scale applications, as well as uh, update your backend on the fly. So it's a really cool tool. And then another show of hands, who's familiar with OpenStack? Cool. So OpenStack is a cloud infrastructure management platform, and it's used to manage and lease resources and hardware in the cloud. All right, cool. So um, for our work this summer, we worked on the OpenShift on OpenStack team. And OpenShift uh, can be run on OpenStack, and that's something that we are trying to accomplish. Um, but why, you might be wondering, do we want to do this? Uh, so basically, uh, when you run OpenShift on OpenStack, it makes it a lot easier to deploy, manage, and scale your OpenShift cluster. Uh, and you can do this by taking advantage of the compute and the networking and storage services in OpenStack. Stack. Um, <clears throat> now, um, developing in an uh, environment that's sitting between two really large technological projects can be pretty complicated, uh, and this is, you know, something that we've been taking on for a little while. Um, but there are working versions of this. Uh, for example, if any of you are familiar with the MOC, that is an OpenShift on OpenStack environment. Um, but anyway, so our team works on code related to um, deploying OpenShift on OpenStack, and we are trying to standardize and optimize that process. Um, so throughout the course of this summer, we've faced several challenges. Um, the first one being adjusting to a new development workflow. And that's something that most developers will have when starting a new project. Uh, more specific to an integration project, such as OpenShift and OpenStack, was making technologies meet in the middle. And so we're going to dive into each of these one at a time and use our summer projects as examples for each. All right. So uh, first off, we're going to talk about uh, getting adjusted to a new development workflow. And we're going to talk about how um, the tooling and the technology that you get exposed to are going to come into play here. Um, so first of all, the um, first thing that you have to do before you get started on any project is obviously communicate with your team. And uh, in terms of the OpenShift and OpenStack team, that can be a little bit more challenging than others because our team is actually distributed uh, across the world. And so um, in order to get started, you're going to have to use a tool called IRC. And how many of you are familiar with IRC? Wow, that's shocking. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, good for you guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and then, so the second fun part about that is since everyone's all over the world, uh, they're not on your 9 to 5 schedule. And so everything that you want to do has to be built around that time zone. And that's going to become increasingly more challenging as your problems get harder to solve. Um, and so as you move along, obviously, you're going to have to eventually hit a point where you ask for help. And um, the first thing that you have to learn about using IRC is you can't be afraid of the chat. Um, and I think that's something that everybody inherently has at first. I know for a fact I was terrified to post in all chat and look stupid for a long time. But eventually, you reach a point where you realize, you know, there's going to be someone who wants to help you. And if you post in all chat, you're more likely to get that help. So uh, do that. <laughs> uh, second of all, um, people might, you know, always be willing to help you with one problem, uh, and that's fine. But um, don't just ask for help. Ask for resources. Um, a lot of the times, people will be able to link you documentation or things that you didn't know exist to help you solve your problems on your own. And that could just make the development process easier for everybody. <clears throat> OK. So then uh, there comes DevStack. And this is another part of developing for OpenShift on OpenStack. Uh, if you develop on OpenShift in general, or rather OpenStack, you're probably going to work with DevStack at some point in your life. Um, 
And basically what DevStack does is it builds a little miniature version of OpenStack in your own local environment. And it's kind of neat because you can build from your own source code and deploy it however you like. Um, but uh, just as anything that's software related, um, there are obviously some complications that come along with that, which Eric is going to go over. So have any of you guys ever set up DevStack before? All right, for those of you who haven't, buckle in. <laughs> First thing you're going to need to do to set up DevStack is stack it. So basically, you just have to run this script. It takes about half an hour. Works fine. It's great. But if you want to include services such as like Octavia, which is OpenStack's load balancer, you're going to have to set that up in the config file. So you're going to have to do that and then stack it again. That's going to take another half hour. So you're already at over an hour of time spent still setting it up. So you add these services, you restack it, should be fine. No, something's not going to work. As me and Emilio experienced, like I don't want to exaggerate, <laughs> but we spent six or seven years setting up that <laughs> And uh, so we spent a lot of time debugging, then finally restacking again. And this process continued and continued and continued, but we got it, and DevStack is a great tool. All right. So, um now we're going to get into the sub-project within OpenShift and OpenStack that both of our projects were related to, and that is career. So first and foremost, the most important part of this slide is this guy, and that is the career platypus. Um, he's unofficially named Carlton. Don't remember that. I didn't tell you that. Uh, <laughs> so basically, what does career do? Uh, career enables OpenShift to use uh, the networking uh, packages and services that are already in OpenStack in place of its own software-defined network. Um, and so why do we want this? Basically, both OpenShift and OpenStack have their own software-defined networking solutions. And the problem there is that both of them are going to inject their own checksums and their own headers into their networking packages. And that makes them very slow to decrypt. Um, so by going around that, you can really speed up the networking uh, for OpenShift on OpenStack. <clears throat> now, uh, Career as a project can be configured to run uh, either in VMs or in Kubernetes, uh, and that allows it to be kind of isolated from your OpenStack environment. Um, but it's not like isolated from the software itself, just you know physically isolated. Uh, and it, you know, there's uh, quite a bit of a tech stack that you're going to have to get used to to work with it. Uh, so my project in specific this summer uh, had to do with scaling out the career controller. And so the career controller is a component of career that um, is responsible for listening for Kubernetes API events in OpenShift and then translating those into the appropriate OpenStack API calls in order to uh, service different networking events that needed resources to be created, modified, or destroyed. Um, and so what that entails is the following. Uh, basically, what we have right now is a high availability mode, uh, and it's an active-passive mode. So if anyone's familiar with what that means, basically, um, it means that one node's going to be active, and then a series of nodes are going to be passive or idle, and they're going to wait for that active node to fail, and then one of them will take its place. Um, and this is good. It's high availability, but the issue is that it doesn't scale out. And when you start having um, bigger data sets, and and bigger data centers, uh, it's going to start getting stressed under load, and uh, we don't want that. So we are working instead to develop an active-active high availability solution, which means that all of the components are able to handle jobs and pick up the slack of any servers that might have died. Um, and overall, the benefit here is that not only is it highly available, but it also scales horizontally. Um, with It scales its performance when you scale horizontally, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, obviously better. <laughs> Uh, and in order to work with it, actually, let me go back real quick. All right, so uh, you see these guys are in little boxes. Uh, that's because in order to run it in high availability mode, you actually have to run it in Kubernetes. And so you're going to have to run the career controller each in its own pod composed of two different containers. Um, and that's where you start running into 
fun stuff with with Kubernetes. Um, so first of all, uh, because both uh, there are two containers running in your pod, it makes debugging a little bit of an interesting situation. Um, and so first of all, uh, when you build a container, I don't know if you guys have built uh, containers before, it's not the fastest process in the world. Um, so don't make the mistake I did at first. Uh, <laughs> you want to be pretty vigorous uh, to and test your code before you build because it will slow down your development cycle a ton. Um, so first of all, read your code. And second of all, take advantage of unit tests. Um, uh, the third thing that I want to mention, which is kind of maybe not for everybody, because I know some people don't use Docker, but um, a lot of people don't always realize that you can actually use the Docker tools as well as Kubernetes tools. Uh, but if you're having a hard time with Kubernetes, remember that you can use Docker's tools, and they have a pretty rich tool set that can help you out a lot. But anyway, back to the unit test slide, because that's pretty important. Um, if you work in OpenStack, then you're going to have to work with talks. And uh, I'm sure at least everyone's somewhat familiar with unit tests. Um, but just to go over them at a high level, you know, um, unit tests are really good for isolating different parts of your code uh, and just making sure that they work the way that you expect them to. And again, what's nice about the unit tests is that you don't need to build your containers or you know your final product even to use them to test your code. And so if you take advantage of them and you build unit tests, to, to test your code along the way, it's going to make your development process a lot faster. There is, however, one part of talks that I think are about unit tests in OpenStack that I think a lot of people won't be familiar with, and that's PEP8. So uh, PEP8 is this fun little test that tests your style. Basically tells you whether or not you suck at programming. Uh, <laughs> and newsflash, the first time you use it, you're going to suck at programming. Um, <laughs> and I'm uh, not talking about like this. I'm talking like like the, oh, like that many errors. So um, what is PEP8? What does it do? Basically, it enforces a really strict programming style. And it's kind of used to just kind of keep everyone in check. Um, it makes sure that all of your uh, code within a project is uniform to some degree. And it tries to make sure that it's all readable. And at the end of the day, um, it's going to make your code a lot easier to understand whether you like it or not. Um, <laughs> and you know. It's kind of a necessary evil. Now, how many of you are familiar with GitHub? All right, how many of you are familiar with Garrett? All right. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, same. <laughs> yeah. So you're also going to have to learn Garrett if you want to work on OpenShift on OpenStack. And the, you know, the, up, the, the fun part about this is Garrett, you'd think, oh, it's a Git tool. You know, how, how, how different can it be? Actually, it's like really different. Um, so in Garrett, um, first of all, you don't follow the standard open source workflow like you do in GitHub. You don't fork it. You don't, you don't make your own branch. You don't take out pull requests. You actually just clone the main project. And then you use something else called Git review. And then you push your code up to Garrett. Um, and this could be a little tricky to learn for the first time. Uh, and there's a lot of little things that go on underneath the hood that you don't really realize. Um, once another thing you might not notice, or you might not know at first, is that um, when you submit your code to check it into Garrett and you don't want a code review, you actually have to go in and give yourself a bad code review. And then <laughs> basically give yourself a minus one to tell everybody, don't review this. I didn't know that. I got code reviewed. It didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the upside of Garrett is actually it's kind of neat um, to, it's a really neat way to manage uh, a lot of projects that are taking, uh, or a lot of people that are working on one project at a time. And I think in comparison to Git, personally, I like it better as a way to um, see the various stages in your code and to see either the reviews that people left, what changed, and ultimately just to see what projects are going on in general. And we'll just take a look here. So this is what a standard um, project uh, commit would look like in Garrett. And you can see here your history, and these would be the changes that you've made along the way. And each of those are expandable, which is pretty nice. Um, 
But when you look at the project view like this, right, you can see all of the projects that are being worked on under one large project and all of their progress, which is, I think, a lot more organized than Git. Either way, though, I can't speak for the OpenStack team. I don't know why they chose to use Garrett over GitHub. But um, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to use it. So deal. <laughs> So anyway, the grand takeaways here are um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, and if you do ask for help, also remember, ask for documentation every now and then. Um, always try to take advantage of all the tools that you have at your disposal. And you know, ultimately, <laughs> you're going to bump into some stuff you might not like and definitely won't be used to. But there's probably a reason that it's there, and it's usually there to help you. So you know, get used to it. So now I want to talk to you guys about making technologies meet in the middle. So being a member of the OpenShift and OpenStack team, the obvious OpenShift and OpenStack, we had to make them meet in the middle. But there's also services within them that we had to adjust to meet in the middle. So this summer, my project was called Watch Endpoints as a Service, or the acronym WIS for short. Um, basically, what it is is a service to speed up Courier by listening for networking events. So I'm going to talk about what that means in a sec. So why do we want this tool? So this is a diagram of the interaction between a bunch of services. You only really need to look at that part right there between the career controller and the Neutron, which is OpenStack's network control. And basically, you can see that the career controller creates a load balancer, and then it will continuously pull Neutron using the OpenStack API to show the load balancer until it becomes active. So the way I've been describing this through an analogy is imagine you're a chef in the kitchen, and you want to make a cake you're going to have to preheat the oven. The current system in place is the chef is going to be going back to that oven every three seconds until the oven has been preheated. What my tool does is it just has the oven alert the chef when it's ready. So you can just see by that that it's a lot less work and it's a lot more efficient. So how do I do this? Uh, basically, there's this messaging queue between Neutron and uh, Octavia, which is the low balancing service, and RabbitMQ is getting a queue of all the messages, as it is a messaging queue. So when the career controller tries to create a load balancer, eventually when it becomes active, Octavia will send a message to Neutron saying that it has become active. My tool will sit and listen to the messaging queue and wait for that event. Once it sees that event happen, it'll tell the career controller. So this makes too much sense. This is the obvious solution. So why isn't this currently in place? Basically. The career guys asked the Neutron guys to add this to the API, and they said no. They said, thou shall not take events that came not from route MQ, for that would be duplication, and we're running shorter on maintainers. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> so what's the end game? If they already rejected this idea, why am I doing this? Basically, we're going to uh, test it with career Kubernetes, and if it uh, behaves as we expect it to, being faster and more efficient, then we're going to propose it to OpenStack as a career sub-project. And if that goes well, it'll be integrated. So this brings me to the challenge of making two technologies meet in the middle. My listener would not hear any Octavia load balancer events. He would hear the port events fine from Neutron, but it wouldn't hear anything from Octavia. So naturally, because it was working with, port, or with Neutron and not Octavia, I figured the problem must have been within my listener. So my train of thoughts First of all, I assume that Neutron and Octavia events assume, uh, behave the same way, because they're both OpenStack services, so why would they not? Secondly, when I would use an a OpenStack load balancer command, it would generate events, but they appear to look like port events, like the event type in the uh, JSON return would be port dot something. So at the time, I assumed that these were Octavia events because they were being generated by a load balancer call. So based on these assumptions, there was no way to distinguish these Octavia events from the actual port events. And so this was an issue, because if this tool can't sort the events in that manner, it kind of defeats the purpose of it, because then you're going to be sending back hundreds upon hundreds of messages back to their career controller. So the explanation of all of this, we figured out after talking to the load balancer guys, is that Octavia doesn't actually emit events, like Neutron does. So why is this, and why do we assume this? Basically, on the career side of things, where I kind of was, uh, we just assumed that most OpenStack services emit events. Why wouldn't Octavia? 
on the Octavia team, they thought, why make it a bit of mess? Uh, Ironic, which is uh, OpenStack bare metal provisioning tool, didn't do it. And it was never a requirement, so it was never enabled, which makes sense. So both sides had reasonable expectations. There was just this miscommunication. So meeting in the middle, how did we fix this issue temporarily? Over here, you have career expectations, Octavia capabilities. In the middle, there's load balance as a service version two. So if this satisfies, if this behaves how we want it to, why is this the final solution? Why aren't we using this? Well, for two reasons. The current OpenStack deployment uses Octavia, uh, and also LBOS v2 is deprecated. So right now, we're in talks with the Octavia team to get them to reconfigure Octavia to a mid events. But for now, we're using this for testing purposes. And this isn't the first time the chip stack teams had to meet in the middle. In the past, OpenShift requires that nodes, a node being an OpenStack server, uh, can talk to each other through their host names as opposed to via IP addresses. Whereas OpenStack doesn't natively support this. So the solution they found is called Neutron DNS. And it's actually a tool that they've had built into OpenStack for a while now. Nobody really knew about it, though. So just digging deeper helped them find the solution to this. So less than being. Sometimes you have to dig deep to find a common ground. So throughout this summer, we dealt with a lot of challenges. <laughs> but uh, we really learned that teamwork and collaboration between teams is crucial. Uh, there's so many different teams, so many different resources out there, especially via IRC, that it really behooves you to make use of them. Uh, take advantage of your resources. And Red Hat, obviously, is all about open source. So open source means being part of the community. So you really want to take advantage of the whole community because you do have that support. Thank you. Questions? So when you start hearing, you just start off. You the question, so we can go. Oh, okay. Do you, do you want to take, pass this around? Um, what did he ask? He's asking about Garrett. What, what specific, wait, what did you ask about Garrett? Hang on, microphone. Yeah, I think that's right, right. You can use this one. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> Garrett questions are fun. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, when you say Gear, it, it, it sounds like it's like a replacement of GitHub. But you, I think when I use Gear, I still need to clone the repo, and then I can add the Gear is like an extra tool for Git that you can use on a computer. So I'm just confused. We'd be able to just talk more because I was confused about Gear as well. Oh yeah, um, I think Garrett actually works with GitHub. You can host your code up on GitHub, and I think Garrett is really more for um, managing uh, different commits and code review. So instead of using like the traditional workflow, like I think for most open source project projects in general, what people normally do is you'll fork a GitHub repo, and then you'll work within your own fork. You'll make a branch, and then you'll take a pull request out against the upstream. Um, but when you use Garrett, you don't do that. Um, basically, what happens is you just clone down the, I feel like I'm too close to this. Uh, <laughs> basically, what happens is you just clone the upstream, and you can make whatever changes you want. And when you submit it, you use a tool called Git Review. And Git Review is going to, I don't know all the details, but essentially it tags your, your work with something called a change ID. And then all of the changes that you make under that change ID get submitted into one general repository. And then eventually, if it's reviewed and accepted, then those changes can be pushed back up to the master, to the upstream GitHub. That's perfect. I can add on. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we use Gerrit a lot uh, in Red, Red Hat uh, to uh, explain it to you in the simplest of terms. Uh, when you use GitHub, and say you submit, so you commit something and there are changes requested, you send a V2 with a new commit ID. So in your history, you have a commit ID, then a V2 commit ID, a V3 commit ID. Uh, when you use Garrett with Git, it allows you to edit a single commit. So you can do, uh, 
because it uses something called change ID. So say you commit so, something, get it tagged with the change ID. Say your team request changes. Hey, you made a mistake. You don't change the commit. It, you don't change the commit ID. You keep the same commit uh, ID. You keep the same change ID, and you can make changes to the same commit. So when you look back, you have a cleaner history, and one in one commit you can see all the uh, comments v1, v2, v3 just for the same commit. So Gerrit allows you to do that. In GitHub, it's like just more of a keep sending commits sort of a thing. So it's similar, but it's not the same. It gives you more granular uh, control. Yeah, it's very yeah. true. Although it's it's fair to say that, that GitHub is starting to develop more Garrett-like workflow tools because they're they're recognizing that the workflow component of it is actually really important. Um, I had a question. I apologize. I missed the first few minutes. Um, did you all? Did you guys? Uh, did you talk about um, what is the? Well, two things. Uh, the the rationale for the work in the first place, like what problem are you trying to solve? If you talked about that, then ignore me, because I know. I just want to make sure that everybody else heard it. Um, the other thing I'm curious about is what you see coming in the next few months for the shift on stack work. Like where do you expect it to land in uh, you know, next version or whatever that is? So, then you all feel bad for the future? Uh, let's enter the... Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> um, in terms of the first part of the question, um, I, we, we did go over a little bit just the concept of what the shift on stack team is trying to accomplish uh, and why, how career is part of that uh, goal. Uh, that being said, if you want to add to that, um, feel free to. Uh, <laughs> if anyone has any questions about it, please ask. Um, in terms of um, the future, though, for my project at least, we're going to containerize it for triple O, open stack on open stack. And um, I'm not sure what the next steps after that will be. Uh, yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I'm pretty sure my project is not ready to get pushed on. It was a lot more research um, focused. Uh, that being said, I think some of the changes that were done are going to be kept, and I think some of the changes serve as an example of what we should not be doing in the future, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, that's part of the process. Um, and yeah, so I think, yeah. Also, I do know for a fact that in terms of um, just the active active, I know that the open uh, shift and open stack team has decided to kind of put that aside by now, for right now. Um, it's going to be coming. I don't know if it's going to be in the next release, but it's, it's on the menu, just it's not a high priority. We have not open stack project. There's a lot of directions that that the team is going in. On one side is just supporting new features, like making sure that we we, we support things like Ceph and stuff like that. Um, another uh, part of that is like standardize, standardize, standardizing the project uh, the process so that other people can just uh, play OpenShift and open stack easily and without having to do a lot of customizations. Um, the third part, which I think is what you guys kind of concentrated on, is optimization, which is um, making sure that uh, bits of the code are optimized in this case, uh, case networking. Um, so that's what you guys were concentrating on. But we have we're, we're, we're going in multiple directions with OpenShift and OpenStack. If anyone is curious, you can talk to me afterwards. Right. And also, just so just to give you guys an idea of like what OpenShift on OpenStack, like why we are interested in developing this, you're like we like think of it as like it's kind of our hybrid cloud offering because we right now OpenShift can run on almost any cloud service provider, um, including OpenStack, and we want uh, customers who are thinking of building clouds either on-prem or in the cloud to be thinking about using OpenStack as their under cloud solution. So, yeah.
Well, I have another question. It's like I know that there's a container app, like module for OpenStack. With, I forgot the name. Is it? Shin or? Uh, there's a like, yeah. There's like a container module for OpenStack. Um, but I just can't remember the name. But uh, what's the difference if you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm between not sure. between using OpenShift and the the one. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is okay. This is this is very ancient history. There used to be a project called um, called uh, Project Solum, S O L U M, which was about essentially making using OpenStack as a container scheduling system. That's long since been obsoleted by Kubernetes. Um, there is another sort of interesting effort in OpenStack land around what's called Kata containers. Kata containers are actually um, a, a, a fully free and open source implementation of Intel's clear containers, which are really VMs that you can spin up very, very quickly. They're super minified VMs that boot almost as fast as a container. Um, and there's some movement within OpenStack to make Kata containers sort of a first-class citizen. But you'd, there's at this point, there's no competing with Kubernetes momentum in the container space, we don't think anyway. If that if that answers your question. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, guys.